Hey there, I pray this video encourages you and helps you grow and become more like Jesus. Follow along with the notes linked in the description. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button. Enjoy. Would you open up your Bibles to uh, Matthew 24? And I'm going to do that with you. Uh, a few weeks ago, we took a break from our Acts series where we were studying the book of Acts. And uh, I stopped to examine and discern the, the things that are going on in our world. And for us to look at scripture and say, hey, what's, are we living in, in the last days? Are we, are we living in end times? Well, let me just tell you this, that technically, since Jesus was born and came into the world and then ascended and the spirit came down, according to Acts 2, we've been in the last days. So the, the thing is, is are we in the latter of last days? You know, that's what we've been examining. And one of the ways we can tell that is by looking at Matthew 24, because these signs, actually many of them take place, and many of the events in Matthew 24 actually take place in the seven-year tribulation. But we're not in the seven-year tribulation right now. We are before that. And so um, these signs that we're reading about are really preceding already. They're showing up around our world. Uh, the ones that we've been examining. And I only put the key verse today for our scripture in the beginning. So let me, if you, if you have your Bibles, let's, let's read this. Um, and I'm going to read it in the New Living Translation, the one I typically use. Um, but the key verse will come up in verse 12. And that will be the only one on the screen at this time. So I want to give you context again to help you for anyone who's new where we've, where we've been uh, at in our scripture, and I just want to give you a heads up. We are not saying that we're in the seven-year tribulation or anything like that. We're just saying that if, if when the seven-year tribulation occurs, these kind of things are going to happen with intensity. Well, we're already seeing those things bud. Okay, they're they're showing. All right, and so let me start with verse one again. Matthew 24, verse one: As Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings. But he responded, do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth, that they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. And he's referring to the temple there. And in AD 70, Rome destroyed the Jewish temple. Okay, completely destroyed it. All right, not, uh, not some of the, the grounds around it were done. Uh, you can see the, the wall, the western wall is still up. That wasn't the temple. Okay, but the temple was completely destroyed. So that already was fulfilled in AD 70. Okay, after that, more and more things happened. One of the things we learned the first week was that uh, Israel became a nation again in 1948. That is key because in the end times, uh, Israel will be attacked when they are a nation again. So now that they're a nation, uh, a large amount of armies will come against them in the end days that we haven't seen yet, but we're seeing that working right now, aren't we? We're seeing that activity build right now. So that's why we pause just to take a look at that. But let's keep going forward because we're going to see other signs that's really making me go, whoa, what's going on right now? You know, I, uh, it's got my attention, okay? Uh, verse 3, later Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. This is why it's called the Olivet Discourse. His disciples came to him privately and said, tell us, when will all this happen? What sign will signal your return in the end of the world. Now he doesn't tell them when the, the, the temple is going to be demolished. He focuses on the later question. Okay. When Jesus told them, he said, or Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah. They will deceive many, and you will, be, uh, you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Everyone say, don't panic. Don't panic. All right. No need to panic or be alarmed right now. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world, but all this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. And they were, the, the disciples were persecuted and killed, and this will happen again to Christian, or to, to uh, the Jewish people specifically in the end times. Uh, they will be attacked and persecuted. Are we seeing that? Yes. 
and many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and will deceive many people. Sin, here's our key verse, sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end will be saved and the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the world, the whole world, so that all nations will hear it and then the end will come. So that's been our focus and last week we talked about the false messiahs, teachers, and prophets. And this week I want to focus on the increase of wickedness and the love of many growing cold. Now the NIV says this, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. I believe that the wickedness that we're seeing is a, re a direct result of false teachers too. When false teachers, including false teachers within churches, which we discussed last week with the false teachers and prophets that are rising up in churches, when they teach false things, it permits people to do wrong things. Now, this works hand in hand too, okay? So as... Um, wickedness increases, so will uh, the, the waning of love. The love will grow cold because wickedness hinders your ability to love. But at the same time, when love grows cold or love wanes and people don't love anymore, wickedness increases too. So they really affect each other. And I, I, I refrained and I just, just wanted to tell you, I'm going to get to the good news too today, okay? <laughs> I know last week was heavy. You know, the first week was heavy. End times is heavy. I mean, you can't read Revelation and go, what in the world is going to happen in the end days? You know, it's, it's wild. Um, but I, I did not get pictures for examples of the increase of wickedness that we're living in. You know why? The whole world right now is a stage of that. But I, can I give you three, I'm going to give you three examples. Um, and I do this carefully because of young ears and such, okay? Um, I saw recently three critical reviews of, 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 th of three things, all right? And you may not be aware of these because here's, here's why. Um, wicked things don't make the news the secular news, so to say. Yeah, like they're going to show the crime and all that stuff. But I mean like evil, wicked things are not making the news critically. You know, no one's criticizing that. Why? Because the world accepts that. So I follow Christian teachers who expose things that are evil and wicked. You, do you follow me? Okay, the different perspective. And they, they, are, they are people I trust. Let's put it that way. Okay. And the first one, and you may have already seen this, is a reality TV show called Naked Education. You may have seen advertisements for this, where they explore human sexuality and kids are the audience learning about it. But they show them literally naked. And this is a reality TV show for educational purposes. Okay? That's concerning, right? Uh, how about this? A library hosting a family event about demon summoning, summoning demons. So we have Christian writers and authors who are not allowed to be in libraries, but we're allowing that to happen in libraries. Christian authors who want to share their book about values and morals, but we don't let them in certain libraries, but we're gonna allow this kind of garbage, evil stuff. See. Well, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me stop there. Now, this one's really concerning. Um, and you may, not even, you, 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 you may not believe me, but I saw it myself on a channel that I follow, and it was real. Um, a woman who teaches people on social media how to perform an abortion ceremony that disturbingly resembles a sacrifice ritual. And that was, um, I sent that to a fellow pastor and I said, how long will God wait to come back? 
and uh, it was disturbing to see. Um, this is why we're going to pray at the end of the sermon today, because <laughs> this is the world that our children are going to grow up in. And with the ease and accessibility of information, this is what people are watching. Now, I want to encourage you with this. The comment section was rebuking her content over and over again. In other words, a lot of people spoke against it, which was good. Even unchristian people, you know. So thank the Lord for that, okay? So all is not lost. But let me address this verse in two parts. The increase of wickedness and the love of many will grow cold. That will be the second part. Are you okay? Are you with me? And I'm just scratching the surface of what we've seen in our world, right? So um, in Matthew 24, Jesus referenced the wickedness in the days of Noah as well. And Luke records Jesus including the days of Lot. Are we aware of those days? That uh, actually Genesis 6, 2 through 11 talk about how sexual lust and violence was rampant at that time. And the same thing in the days of Lot, there was uh, sexual distortion Okay, and it was evil, and the examples are vivid. If you want to read about it, um, you can read that in Genesis 18 through 19. The wickedness in the days of Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah was so bad that God had to rain down sulfur and fire upon those cities to cleanse the world so that that wickedness did not spread through the world. But in both stories, in the days of Noah and the days of Lot, God preserved a remnant of righteous people, didn't he? And so there was still righteousness, but there had to be a, a sanctification, a consecration, a separation that these people cannot live among them or participate with them any longer because God was done with it. He was judging it, and so he flooded the earth. And then he rained down sulfur and fire upon Sodom and Gomorrah, okay? So... That is the wickedness that Jesus refers to to help us understand that in the last days, it's going to be like that, but worldwide. It's not going to be just localized. It's going to be everywhere. So we need to be willing to open our eyes in what we're seeing and not be okay with the wickedness we're seeing, but also don't be overwhelmed or discouraged by it either. Okay, because God has a plan. God has a plan. All right, amen. All right, so what's happening today? Wickedness is suppressing our society's ability, and even, unfortunately, even in the church, certain churches, the ability to discern righteousness and truth from wickedness and deception. So wickedness actually suppresses truth, according to Romans chapter 1. In Isaiah 5.20, it says this, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That's what we are seeing again, because this happened around a thousand years ago, or a thousand years before Christ, a thousand, one thousand BC. So three thousand some years later, here we are seeing people once again calling evil good and good evil. Exchanging, uh, you know, darkness for light and light for darkness, bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. How did we get here? It's really simple. We reject God, and when we reject God, we we reject truth. And without God, there is no moral truth and consequently no moral clarity, no clear moral clarity or understanding of what morality is. Without accepting God and his truth, humanity is forced to draw their own beliefs, convictions, and moral lines. However, the hearts of mankind are deceitfully wicked, Jeremiah 17 says. Some will draw moral lines, but not everyone will. And if we do draw moral lines, we struggle to follow them, don't we? And by the way, moral, morality is borrowed from God because God is the moral lawgiver. So if, if humanity wants morality without God, they're still borrowing God's morals. But what we have is we have humanity trying to make their own morals, and they're not doing a very good job at it. And they don't want to admit that they're already taking what God said to do. 
But if, if, if we're left to mankind coming up with how to be good, we're in trouble because our hearts are deceitfully wicked. We need God's holiness and God's truth to help us actually determine what is holy and true, what is righteous. So what we're seeing in the world is we're seeing people trying to determine what is ethically good and righteous and holy, um, but they need God's help, but they're rejecting God at the same time. And again, we can create moral laws to follow and, and morality to follow, but we're not very good at following it. Just look at the Israelites in the Old Testament. And you know what? Let's be honest about our own life. We're not perfect, are we? So we need the help of God to live this way. Now, wickedness is doing something else. It's making the love of many grow cold as well. It's making the love of many grow cold. I believe wickedness is the reason why we're having so much, uh, so many people struggle to love the way God has called us to love. Let's go to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy uh, 3, 1 through 5. I thought I saved that spot, but I didn't. Okay, 2 Timothy 3. Paul's writing to his young pastor, Timothy. And he says, you should know this, or the NIV, mark this. Like, mark this. Mark what I'm saying. Listen carefully to what I'm saying. You should know this, Timothy, that in the last days there will be very difficult times. For people will love only themselves and their money. They will be boastful and proud, scoffing at God and mocking God, really, too. Have you seen that? I have. Disobedient to their parents. Oh, kids, you better start obeying. You know what I'm saying? There's our man. <laughs> and ungrateful. Now, you, you know, that seems small, but I've been working uh, with people over the years, and I, I have seen the ungrateful hearts increase. Like, there's no thank yous or appreciation for people anymore. There's a lack of that, and we're, we're, here's our Thanksgiving message. Be grateful. Okay, here we go. Get ready for Thanksgiving, all right? Let's not be like that. Let's be grateful for everyone in our life, all that God has done. Amen? Let's, let's, let's suppress wickedness by following this, the opposite of the scripture and doing the opposite of the scripture. Okay? All right. You'll see people ungrateful. Okay? And I'll give you a reason why this matters in a moment. They will consider nothing sacred. They will be unloving and unforgiving. They will slander others and have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. <clears throat> they will betray their friends, be reckless, be puffed up with pride, and love pleasure rather than God. They will act religious, but they will reject the power that can make them godly. Stay away from people like that. Now, I'm going to go a little further because this one's really concerning. They are the kind who work their way into people's homes and win the confidence of vulnerable women who are burdened with the guilt of sin and controlled by various desires. Wow. And he's talking about the teachers that will do this, but even people will do this. They'll wiggle their way in to vulnerable people's lives to get what they want. And it's evil. So... Let me stop there. How does wickedness cause the love of man to grow cold? Wickedness distorts and darkens the hearts of mankind, damaging our ability to truly love, even in the most common ways. Wickedness hurts our ability to love God. It turns one's focus from loving others to loving self. And God says to love him and to love your neighbor as you would love yourself and to show love to the lost. And so wickedness hurts our ability to properly love God. And one of the ways we love God is by loving others. But we're also supposed to love God by being holy and pure. And it says here in our scripture, in this context, loving material possessions, being lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, not loving what is good and becoming unholy. 
These are all descriptions that Paul just gave Timothy of signs in the end times. So wickedness hinders people's ability to even love God. Secondly, wickedness corrupts us to have an unhealthy love for self. When you read the scripture, you'll see that as well. It creates a haughty view of oneself that is proud, boastful, conceited, ungrateful, and disobedient to parents. Uh, This results in not being teachable, humble, sorry, or repentant. This is the, the, uh, the wickedness that has distorted our ability to properly view ourselves, and we hold ourselves to a higher view than we should. And then we begin to hurt other people in the process, and that leads me to the third part. These are the three different things that he labels here, okay? Our, our love towards God, our love about ourselves, our view about ourselves, and then our love towards other people. Wickedness leads to a waning of love and outright hurting others around us. The words that Paul uses are these, and in different translations too. He uses in the scripture, they'll be abusive. They'll be brutal. They'll be rash, treacherous, unforgiving, and simply lacking the ability to show love in relationships that need it. You know, it's one thing to hurt people. It's another thing just to never show love. That hurts too, doesn't it? I don't know how many people I've talked to, they said they never heard their parents say, I love you. That hurts too, doesn't it? And then there's those who actually hurt people more than they ever show love. And Paul ends with one more concerning sign in the last days. There will be those, quote, having a form of godliness but denying its power, the NIV says. Or the NLT says, they will act religious, but they will reject the power that can make them godly. In other words, they will act religious, but they don't have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. The power needed to be godly. The power needed to be righteous. And then he finishes this paragraph saying, have nothing to do with such people. Well, wait a second. I thought we're supposed to love everyone And I thought we're supposed to, you know, reach everyone. So what does this mean? Well, let me tell you what a scholar wrote. While Christians need to reach out and maintain positive relationships and influence with people who do not know Christ, they are to stay away from hypocritical people who pretend to follow Christ but are simply trying to fool God and others. Such people tend to distort Christ's message, mislead others spiritually, and cause divisions in the church. See, it's one thing for someone who is willing to receive your love and receive your care. It's another thing for someone to reject it and to say that they're good, they're godly, they're holy, but they don't want the help of people in the church. Or they pretend to be something they're not. They're hypocrites, and the Bible says have nothing to do with them. Why? Because they can corrupt you. Their lies can be so deceiving they can corrupt you. 2 Timothy 2, 22 says this, run from anything that stimulates youthful lust. Run, run from sin. Instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. There you go. So in the body of Christ, If someone is being hypocritical and being a liar and they're saying one thing and then they're doing another and and you've caught it and they don't take your correction, your loving correction, then the Bible says have nothing to do with them. All right? Now, for those in the church who are genuinely pursuing God, pursuing righteousness, faithfulness, love, and peace, he says enjoy the company of those people because you're going to need it. This is still in the same book the same context of being careful of the end days. You're gonna need godly fellowship, amen? Amen. There should be more people in church in these days right now than there are back in the day. This church should be filled with people who need Jesus, right? And people who also need the fellowship of Christians, okay? Now, does does this mean that we're impatient with one another? Does this mean that we quickly judge people and call them hypocrites? Absolutely not. I would never teach that. But we do need to be careful and, and mark those people. 
but also judge their fruit as we learned last week. Discern the fruit in people's lives. You will know them by their fruit, Matthew 7 says. Amen? So running from wickedness many times means not running with a crowd who lives in or excuses wickedness. That's what that means too. So I have good news. I, I promise I'll give you some good news. Are you ready? While, while sin will increase and the love of many will grow cold, righteousness will increasingly shine. Righteousness will increasingly shine. God is reaching many and righteousness is increasing too. It may not be as many people as we hope, but I, I actually see a, a revival taking place around our world. The darkness does not overcome the light according to scripture. People are waking up to the absurdity of their wickedness, of their wickedness, and they're waking up to it because they're seeing the wickedness of the world. And they're going, well, I, I can't judge the world if I'm living the same way. And so people are waking up because they're like, this is crazy. Our world is going to hell in a handbasket. I got to change. Jesus must be coming back. I mean, I'm literally reading comments on YouTube, social media channels of people saying these things underneath the thread. People are saying, I got to get to church. I got to talk to Jesus. I need to get my Bible open. And I'm like, praise the Lord. Increasing righteousness. Yes. So God is opening people's eyes. God is not wasting it, and he's helping people see. Let me show you some pictures of things that won't make the news because it doesn't really sell on our mainstream media. All right, check out this first picture. This is in Times Square November, in November. Just a couple weeks ago, this pastor held a, a revival service in Times Square. I don't know if it made the news. I didn't see it on the news. Thousands of young people there worshiping God, preaching the gospel, doing miracles right there in Times Square. That didn't make the news. God is on the move. How about the next, the next picture? And so this, yeah, go back to that. This has actually been happening for years. This is CFAN, Christ for the Nations, in African countries. I mean, we're talking major revival taking place. In the midst of chaos and anarchy in Africa, God is moving. God is working. God is using his His true faithful leaders to go and preach the gospel. Healings are happening. Miracles are happening. Praise the Lord. This, that's amazing. And that's just one night. All right, let's, yeah. Let's keep going. Did you hear about the baptism at the university recently, Auburn University? Which, by the way, atheists attacked and they were being scrutinized for allowing this to happen. But this is a baptism where hundreds of college students are giving their life to Christ and getting water baptized. This just happened recently. Praise the Lord. Right here in our colleges. I don't have a picture of the Asbury University uh, revival, but are you aware of that? Asbury University that took place and the revival. They, they had so many people coming into the town, they had to shut the town down. They had to turn people away because thousands of people came. All right? It was amazing. Keep going. The next slide. This is in Pakistan. This is recent, but I sent this picture to my tech, uh, to, to my assistant for tech on Thursday. I was actually in Missouri, so I was writing this message while in Missouri doing ministry. And I sent this picture, and then my friends that are in this picture posted a new one. It was even bigger than this. Pakistan, predominantly Muslim nation, Christian pastors right now, you won't see this in the news. But this is what God is doing right now in Arab nations. And they're not afraid to die for what they're doing. I think we have one more, if I'm not mistaken, maybe a couple more. This is in California recently. 4,000 people got water baptized in California. Lord knows California needs Jesus. Yes. You may be aware of Harvest Church and 
uh, the Jesus movie, what was it called again? The Revolution, Jesus Revolution. Well, that sparked another revival, and over 4,000 people got saved and got water baptized after the movie release. And so they just started doing the same thing they did in the movie. How cool is that? What about this? Are you aware of Ayan Hirsi Ali? Huge in the Islam faith, a Muslim. She actually left Islam to be an atheist. She spoke very hard against Islam, was threatened. People wanted to kill her. Well, she recently just gave her life to Jesus Christ, and now she's a Christian. And she was in a thought conference, so to say, a, uh, a, a teaching conference with intellectuals with Jordan Peterson and others. And she boldly shared her faith in front of all those people. God is saving atheists. God is saving Muslims. God is changing this world. While, it, while wickedness increases, righteousness will shine all the more. All the more. We praise the Lord. How do we counter a wicked culture? Let's go to scripture real quick here. Psalm 37. Psalm chapter 37. I'm just referencing this more than, than breaking it down today, okay? Psalm 37, verse 1. Let this encourage you. Don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong. For like grass, they soon fade away. Like spring flowers, they soon wither. Now, of course, we don't want that to happen. We want people to be saved. We want people to go to heaven. But the reality is there will be wicked people in the end days that will never accept Jesus Christ. There will be judgment and wrath for those who don't believe in Jesus Christ. And it's unfortunate, it's sad, but they deny God and God doesn't want to do that. So just keep that in context. This is Old Testament, but keep in context with God's heart. He doesn't want wicked people to perish. Verse three, what should we do then? If we're righteous, what should we do in the midst of wickedness? Trust in the Lord and do good then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. He will make your innocence or your righteousness radiate like the dawn. And the justice of your cause will shine like the noonday sun. How many know that's the brightest part of the day? In, in the wicked world we live in, God will use your righteousness to shine now, this is referring to the justice, that you are innocent in God's eyes, and you're innocent even though they're accusing you falsely, you're innocent. That's the context. But I want to also use this pr for a principle, that if we live righteousness, if we live righteously in a wicked world, people will see it and want to know more about Jesus. They will see your good deeds and your light and ask, okay? I love that. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Don't worry. Look, I'm not worried. God is on the throne. God has a plan. And God is going to save even wicked people. Praise the Lord. He's not done saving those who are wicked. And I'm praying for them. All right? So, but I'm not going to worry. Stop being angry. Don't be mad. God's got this. Okay, turn from your rage. We, we're, we're upset with what we see, but God's going to deal with it, okay? We need to calm down. Don't lose your temper. It only leads to harm. For their wicked will be destroyed, but those who trust in the Lord will possess the land. Now, for us, that's the new heavens and the new earth. Soon the wicked will disappear. Though you look for them, they will be gone. The lowly will possess the land and will live in peace and prosperity. That is the promise for all who believe in Jesus Christ. We'll be taken with him in the clouds, and we will live with him forever on the new heavens and new earth. It's going to be amazing. That's the promise we have, all right? In Romans 12, uh, 1 through 2, it's on the screen for us as well. This is so important for us. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies, give your lives to God because all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice. Don't be wicked. Live holy the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. 
Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Give your life to worship God, not live for self. This is the opposite of what 2 Timothy 3, 1 through 5 said. Don't live for yourself. Don't love yourself. Don't love pleasures. Don't copy the customs of this world. Live for God. Amen? I'm speeding up here a little bit just to, to go forward here. Secondly, uh, well, first of all, how do we counter wicked culture? We just learned live righteously in the midst of wickedness. Secondly, love in the midst of wickedness. And this is where it can get difficult. Love in the midst of wickedness. Don't let wickedness keep you from loving. In other words, bottom line, don't let it discourage you from loving people. Romans 12, let's go to that. Romans chapter 12. Did I save my spot for this? Let's see. I did. Romans 12, verse 9. Don't just pretend to love others. Ah, the opposite of 2 Timothy 3. Don't just pretend to love others. Really love them. Hate what is wrong. Hold tightly to what is good. I love that. Love each other with genuine affection and take delight in honoring each other. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. That's how your love stays warm. When you serve the Lord, it doesn't grow cold if you continue to serve the Lord. All right? Rejoice in our confident hope. Be patient in trouble, like trials, and keep on praying. Don't give up, church. When God's people are in need, be ready to help them. Doesn't that keep the fire going? The love, when we help each other, always be eager to practice hospitality. Okay, here's where it gets harder. Bless those who persecute you. Okay, don't curse them. Pray that God will bless them, that God will help them, that God will show mercy to them. Pray for that. Be happy with those who are happy. Don't be jealous or envious. Be happy. And weep with those who weep. Show empathy and, and mercy and compassion. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people and don't think you know it all. Verse 17, it gets hard. Never pay back evil with more evil. Do things in such a way that everyone can see you are honorable. Do all that you can to live in peace with everyone. All that you can. Dear friends, never take revenge. Leave that to the righteous anger of God. He has righteous anger. We, we tend to not have that, you know. <laughs> Sometimes we have that righteous indignation and we got to check ourselves. But he is pure in his righteous anger, okay? For the scriptures say, I will take revenge. I will pay them back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals of shame on their heads. Uh, this is actually a visual that possibly the Egyptians did. When they wanted to admit that they were wrong, they would carry burning coals over their head. And so he's saying maybe that when you show love, people will admit that they're wrong. That it will, it will heap that, that, that healthy guilt, that shame on them. How, why did I do that to that person? Meanwhile, here they are loving me. And so hopefully they will admit and show that they, they were wrong. That's beautiful. And then my favorite verse, don't let evil conquer you, but conquer evil by doing good. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by doing good, the NIV version. Do not be overcome by evil, church. Do not be overwhelmed by it. Do not let it keep you from loving people. Overcome evil by showing good and showing love. That's how we help this world in the midst of these beginning last days or the latter days, so to say, these signs that are budding and showing more and more, how do we help? We suppress wickedness by loving God and loving others. That's how we do it. That's how we do it. People are going to change. People are going to open up to God because they see a love and a strength in the midst of wicked days. They see something different about you. Will everyone receive it? No. 
Can we take time to pray here today? Why don't we stand together? If you're here today and you're saying, wow, Ryan, I'm a wicked person in need of help. Maybe you're online watching this. Maybe you're not even watching today. You're going to watch in the future because this is online. And you're saying, I'm a wicked person. I need to be saved. I can't stop doing wicked things. I have good news for you. That's why Jesus was born. Jesus was born to save all mankind from sin if they would believe. He came to save mankind from their sins. Listen to this verse, 2 Corinthians 5, 21. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. I'm going to read that one more time. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right or righteous with God through Christ. It's only by accepting and believing in the sacrifice of Christ for our sins that you can exchange a heart bent on sinning to a new heart that desires to live righteously. You, in other words, you ready for this? You can't be righteous on your own. You need Jesus' righteousness. And God made that possible by giving his son Jesus to make you righteous. And you only appropriate that, you only receive that. It's only imputed into you through his spirit when you believe in Jesus Christ. When you believe in Christ, you are declared righteous in his sight. So when you try to be righteous on your own power, you will fail every time. And good deeds is not righteous deeds. We need the holiness of Jesus Christ, the perfection of Jesus on us, in us, through his spirit, identifying us as one of his children, Ephesians 1 says. We need his spirit to identify us as a child of God, a holy child of God. And right now, if that's you, I want to encourage you to not delay and believe in Jesus Christ for salvation. You, will, you, you won't have to try so hard to do what's right and holy and righteous. The Spirit of God will live in you and help you do that. Isn't that beautiful? That's what, that, for us believers, we, we remain confident and, and, and secure in our faith. We have assurance in our faith because we believe in the righteousness and the righteous works of Christ, not our own. So today as believers, be encouraged. If you've trusted in Jesus Christ, you are saved. You are righteous in his eyes and you can be at peace. Now, should we be living however we want? No. Instead, we should be grateful and appropriate the grace that God has given us to live holy lives. It's his grace that enables us to live righteous lives, to live the life he wants us to live. We won't do it perfectly. Praise the Lord. Jesus is there. His grace is upon us and with us. But we must appropriate that grace to live holy and righteous. But if that's you today and you need Jesus, you need to give your life to him. Why don't you just do that where you are? And we're going to have prayer team members here. If you need prayer for anything, come on up while, we are, while we're praying here. I thank you for hanging out a little longer. We need to take time to pray for our world, okay? And we need to pray that God will keep our hearts sensitive to love one another, okay? So let's take a moment. If you need prayer, come on down. We have someone here. If you need prayer team members over here, if you don't mind, Pastor Cornelius and others, we need some over here on this side. If you need prayer for anything, if you need to give your life to Christ, you can do it right where you are. Ask him. Ask him to save you. Ask him to change you. Ask him to come into your life and make you a new person. Tell him, I'm giving, you, I'm giving up my wicked heart for a new heart. I want that. Church, let's bow our heads, close our eyes, and let's just pray together. And can we just begin to just ask God to help us apply this sermon? Let's do that right now. Just begin to talk to him. I'm not going to lead us yet. Just begin, to, just begin to pray. Ask him to help you apply this message today. Thank him for the grace and the righteousness he has given us. We thank you, God. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Can't do it without you, God.
We can't do it without you, God. Help us to live righteous, Lord. We thank you, Lord. Help us to love in the midst of this wicked world we're living in. Help us, God. Thank you, God. Thank you for saving us today. Thank you, Lord God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We love you, God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We need you, God. We need your help, Lord. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah, Lord. We praise you, God. You are worthy of our praise and our glory, God. Help us to live righteous lives, Lord God. Help us to shine the righteousness of Christ, Lord. Not for them to see us, but to see you, Lord God. Help us to love, Lord God. May your spirit flood our hearts, Lord. Flood us with your lives, Lord God. With, your, with our lives, with your spirit, Lord. Flood us, Lord God. We need your help, Lord, to love in these times we're living in, God. We thank you, Lord, for what you're doing around the world, Lord. We thank you, God. We thank you, God, that your righteousness is moving, Lord. That your goodness is moving, Lord. You're saving lives. You're working miracles, Lord. We thank you for that, Lord. Help us, Lord, to be agents of change, transformation in our communities, in our homes, Lord. Start with our own lives and in our own homes, Lord, and our workplaces, God. In the marketplace, in the community, Lord. I pray, God, that we would suppress wickedness, that we would push back darkness with the light of Christ, that we would shine all the more in this dark world we're living in, Lord. We thank you, God. We love you, Lord. We praise you, God.